Uh, good afternoon. Um, first of all, a great thanks to Leaders Forum and, uh, um, <coughs> and Viva and Avina for convening this amazing conference on all of these uh, great speakers today. Um, and thanks also for including Endeavor um, in the event. So um, I'm going to talk eventually about Endeavor's role in supporting high-impact entrepreneurs, particularly in Latin America. But first, I'd like to take a step back and present it in a, a larger context. And in fact, following um, the previous speaker, um, I want to talk about uh, jobs from... Whoop, there we go. Um, I want to take a moment and talk about jobs because I think when we're talking about sustainability, ultimately the challenge of providing uh, jobs for a growing population, a growing youth and urban population, which we've heard about um, in other talks today, is actually an ultimate form of, of leading to sustainability because if we can't figure out how to find jobs for folks in society, we're going to have a lot of other problems, and that's been pointed out uh, today. Um, Specifically in Latin America, these statistics are from the International Labor, or Labor Organization, and they're about, about how, how many jobs are needed by the year 2020 to create full employment. Now, full employment may never happen, but it's certainly a great goal and something we all have to work towards. And in Latin America, in Latin America, um, it looks like Latin America is going to need 66 million new jobs created by 2020 if um, it wants to create full employment. Um, now, where do jobs come from? Uh, there are a number of places they come from. We've heard about uh, uh, small uh, job, uh, sm uh, mom and pop kind of jobs. Uh, there are small and medium sized enterprises. There's government. Um, government was a big source of job creation, but isn't really that sustainable. And when we look at um, jobs around the world, one thing you see here that's quite interesting is there's a big diversion between uh, developed countries, particularly ones with lower unemployment rates, and some key emerging markets. And that's there are larger companies um, per uh, and a million inhabitants in each of these countries. And when I mean large companies, I'm not talking about great multinationals with tens of thousands of jobs. I'm talking about companies with 200 plus employees, and it's dramatic the difference. Um, taking another look at why that's kind of important, um, everyone in the world, we all talk about small business, and small business is a driver everywhere in the world, but small businesses, micro enterprises, don't create that many jobs. And small and medium enterprises, which are generally defined as companies of 20 to 30 employees, also don't do that. But if you can actually take a small and medium sized enterprise and help it grow into a big business, um, the more you can do that, the more you really make a, a difference in society. And it explains actually why unemployment rates in developed countries are often um, much lower than in developing countries. Um, also, another thing to put in perspective is that uh, this is a data based on a World Bank data that our Endeavor Insight research team put together. And we found that 8% of companies in Latin America, based on, on World Bank data, um, are these kind of scale-up companies, scale-up ones that turned from being small and medium-sized companies to 200-plus employee companies. They accounted for 8% of businesses in the region, in the four countries that we looked at, but they, accounted, they generated 46% of net new job creation over the last five years. If you look at the four countries that we were able to get data to measure, the numbers are different, but the patterns are always the same. Um, and so it's really worth keeping an, an, uh, an insight on, and it also brings me to really why Endeavor. So this is really the world that we live in at Endeavor. It's always been about supporting uh, what we call high-impact entrepreneurs, but basically finding small and medium-sized uh, businesses and entrepreneurs that really have the potential to scale to become the 200-plus employer companies. So we started in Argentina in 1998, uh, thanks uh, to an initial seed grant from uh, Avina Foundation and Mr. Schmidt Heine. So uh, thank you again for making it a reality. Um, we've since gone on to expand across the region. We're in seven countries now with offices in 30 cities. Uh, we've taken the model uh, global. We added um, first a number of emerging markets um, and economies, and I think we're missing little outlines of the world there, but that's okay. Um, you can see where we are for those of you that know the map. And the most interesting thing about our model is after expanding from literally Latin America to South Africa, the Middle East, um, and Southeast Asia, in a in really interesting twist in the last two years, we've taken this model that was developed for emerging markets, and we've actually brought it to struggling cities cities in southern Europe and the United States. Um, so what do we do? Um, simply put, we actually help support uh, 
small and medium-sized businesses and scale-up entrepreneurs to build these businesses and to accelerate the growth maybe a lot faster than they might do it on their own. I could spend the rest of my presentation and another hour talking about all the different programs and ways that we do it, but basically these three buckets are key. And um, the networks and mentors is very important because it's also about building trust in these societies of, of people realizing that uh, top executives, top professionals will support them uh, really with no strings attached. The talent programs, I'll just bring up here for all of you students at the University of St. Gallen. Uh, we love MBAs that want to volunteer to work with our companies over the summer. It's a great experience. Check out the EMBA program on our website. Um, interestingly, uh, Fundes mentions this morning that they started out trying to fund small businesses and ended up giving that up. So we actually brought in the access to smart capital later and we bring it in at a later date. So for the few companies that really advance and get to later stage and, and need funding, we actually have programs that work for them. Now, the final thing that we do that's not on this um, chart that's really critical is it's about give back. We insist that all Endeavor entrepreneurs commit themselves to giving back uh, to their countries, their societies, mostly through mentoring the next generation of entrepreneurs. And I'm pleased to say that in our recent survey, 96% of our entrepreneurs um, give back in some way. Um, and even in some cases, many of them that have been the most successful have now gone onto the boards of their local Endeavor affiliate. In Argentina, where we got started, the majority of the board is now made up of of successful Endeavor entrepreneurs who've taken the seats from originally top business executives that funded it. Um. Our results, so we've, we've screened over 40,000 entrepreneurs, but we don't work with that many. We've worked with 1,000 entrepreneurs in the last 15 years. They represent about 650 companies, and probably the most remarkable thing is that these entrepreneurs, mostly in emerging markets, um, have created 400,000 jobs. Um, more than half of those jobs we know were created since they engaged with Endeavor, so we think there's something we're doing right about that. And given the... Um, the, the weight of Latin America and its, its early entry into Endeavor, more than half of those jobs are in Latin America. Um, revenues combined for these companies in the last year we were able to measure them were close to $7 billion. And to give you a perspective on the kinds of companies we found in Latin America and elsewhere in the world, 80 of them would have qualified for the Inc. 500 list of fastest growing U.S. companies. Um, so I just want to pivot a moment now and talk about how our model has been applied to social entrepreneurship. Um, when we talk about Endeavor, we are really interested in any for-profit business, um, but they can be beauty, beauty salons, they can be uh, restaurant chains, they can be software developers, but 20% of our entrepreneurs focus on solving uh, social solutions in education, healthcare, the environment. And so I thought that uh, it would be interesting to talk a little bit about how we take our model and have helped these social entrepreneurs scale. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We did put up a controversial article in Harvard Business Review, and just theoretically, one thing we do believe is even if you're a social entrepreneur, you have to find the balance right of balance balancing the financial goals, and building a strong business if you want to have great impact. Um, first, I thought I'd show you one or two education companies, because these are the companies probably we've worked the longest in social entrepreneurship, and they've had amazing impact. So I'm going to run through them very quickly, but I love telling stories. I think finding out of real companies is, is more interesting than theory. So um, in education, some of you may have heard of Inova. It's a Mexican company. They focus on helping low-income uh, students, uh, mostly children, uh, who are uh, attending failing public schools in, now in the state of Mexico and a few other Mexican states. They've put 150000 and children through their after-school programs. And as we know, if we don't solve the education gap in countries like Mexico, we're going to lose a whole other generation. Um, this is one of my favorite companies in the Endeavor portfolio. It's a Colombian company called Campo Alto. They've helped uh, over 20,000 students, mostly low-income women, move from unskilled jobs to getting certifications, largely in healthcare uh, industry certifications, and really changed the course of these people's lives, build, giving them careers rather than jobs, and helping uh, give a, a, a more livelihood to their families. I'd also add that they already have moved this model out of Colombia and are trying to apply it in other places. Um, so now I want to spend the last part of my uh, presentation talking about the newest area of social entrepreneurship where um, we've begun to focus, which is uh, in green enterprise. And I have the Zenstrom Philanthropies logo um, on the slide because really we, we started doing this effort because uh, Zenstrom Philanthropies came to us and challenged us to look into this area. And they, they came with a, a, 
a concept that we actually couldn't not agree with, which was they believed that private entrepreneurs had a role to play in addressing climate change issues and environment issues. So we're early days with these companies. They're not our biggest companies yet, but I wanted to share with you some of the companies and the challenges they're, they're addressing and what they're doing um, all in Latin America. Um, so in construction, first company I'm going to start with is a Brazilian company called Impacto. Um, they've developed a use of plastic uh, to replace wood um, in uh, construction, especially flooring in new buildings. Uh, it's taken off quite well in Brazil, and given all the talk we've heard about trying to preserve the Amazon rainforest and things, any company that can reduce wood use in Brazil is welcome. Uh, another company, this is one in Colombia called Groncol. Some of you have been to Bogota may have seen some of their signature green walls on buildings, but the big business of this company is actually green rooftops in both new construction but also existing buildings. And it's interesting because I have a point here that Bogota is one of the worst cities when it comes to green space per inhabitant. Even though you see those lovely hills outside the city, there's really no green space and no parks in the city. So uh, Grown Coal addresses that with green rooftops. Um, in agriculture, we've actually worked with um, focusing on bioinsecticides and organic fertilizers, and we think it has a double social impact because not only does it protect the environment, but often farmers who adopt uh, sort of organic systems can actually sell their produce um, at premium prices and higher prices for themselves. So it kind of has a double impact. This is a Chilean company, it's not Jesus. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, they're a great company in Chile doing bioinsecticides. Um, this is a company called Fagro in Mexico. They do organic uh, fertilizers and inputs. Um, I'd be remiss um, in not bringing up a hometown favorite if I'm here in St. Gallen, well, at least in Switzerland. Uh, this is a Swiss entrepreneur that we found in Latin America. Some of you may have heard of him. His name is Patrick Struby. He gave up a job as a commodities trader and went and has trained small, hundreds of small farmers in Mexico, Peru, and Argentina in fair trade uh, and organic growing techniques and then created a marketing uh, program to bring their products mostly to supermarkets in Europe. Um, finally, uh, you can't talk about green entrepreneurship if you don't talk about recycling. It isn't very pretty um, and often doesn't smell that well, but it's very important in the uh, environment. And this is a Mexican company called EcoClean. Uh, they basically put together dozens, I think well over 100 now, of auto shops in Mexico, and they go and they retrieve the waste oil that they have from uh, changing oil changes and other work of cars, and they take that, they uh, refine it again, and they put it back to use. So a great example of recycling. Um, and finally, this is a company in Chile called Ecologica. Um, they're a consulting firm, and what they're doing is going to large companies in Chile that are beginning to realize they need to have a, a green policy, and they're working with them at every stage to talk about um, both the waste they're creating and avoiding that and also uh, recycling their uh, products as well. So um, that's just a look at these companies. As I mentioned, this is our newest area of growth. It's early days for these companies, and here's where you come in, because when I talk about kind of the next steps for this, um, one is that you can help us continue finding these kind of high-impact green companies. If any of you in this room know of companies you think would benefit from being associated with Endeavor in the green world, please let us know or encourage them to find our local offices. Second is to work with us to help quantify the impact of these companies. Our traditional metric has always been jobs, which I think still is the critical metric, and also revenues because we think that's about the way you measure wealth creation. Um, but when we're talking about these green companies, I think there are a number of other impact measurements that we could bring into place. And third is to help us tell these stories. If you enjoyed the stories that I told, go to our website, read about them, tell people about some of the companies you heard about because we really believe at Endeavor that stories of success, particularly local role models, are really what inspire people to go out and do the same thing on their own. So with that, I want to thank you and uh, hope to enjoy talking with most of you tomorrow as well.